If you spent weeks or months or years looking for proof of your spouse's infidelity, because if you just get enough, you can blank. Uh, if this is you, it's time to talk about the evidence and what to do with it, okay? Hi guys, and welcome to the Hope for Spouses Lunchtime Live. If this is your first time visiting the Hope for Spouses Lunchtime Live, I started this ministry because my husband and I were separated for four years due to adultery. And uh, I had to go through a lot of changes myself while God worked on my husband. And we've been back together for just shy of four years now. And so I do this to really give women of God, women who love the scriptures, hope for change in your life. Okay. So uh, one of the things that I did, and one of the reasons I decided to share about this a uh, very... Um, controversial topic about obtaining proof for your spouse's infidelity and then what do you do with it it's just because of some of the things that recently we've seen in the Facebook group the private Facebook group and if you want to get on there you can uh, check that out on Facebook and ask to join but it's because one of the things I'm realizing is we get very obsessed with finding evidence uh, we fall into sin ourselves because we're so um, wanting to control what's actually going on in our life. And, and I don't want you to really fall. I don't want you to live in that state because I did. It is a very, very scary place to be. Uh, you feel like you're drowning. <clears throat> and I don't want you to have to exist there anymore. I want you to be able to move into a safe state with your mind and your heart. But it's also important, uh, if you're watching this, I want to just offer a disclaimer that this, this uh, lesson today, these things that I'm sharing, are for broken marriages. They are not for marriages where there is danger. In other words, you're in danger, your life is in danger, or that you are afraid of being physically hurt. So if that's the case, you need to go to thehotline.org. I'll say that again, thehotline.org, and speak to, you can chat with, you can email. There's people there who can really help you to get some help so you can really get into a safe place to start your healing, okay? The other clarification I want to make as we dive into this topic is that uh, infidelity is not just adultery, okay? It's not just our spouse sleeping with or having an emotional affair with another partner. It's also uh, pornography, especially pornography addiction where they become obsessed uh, with porn and they disengage from the intimacy that, that is designed to be in marriage, okay? So just wanted to really clarify that. Now, if you're here, um, here if you came to this lunchtime live today, it's probably because you're here that uh, because you feel like you are trying to get evidence to prove that your spouse has been unfaithful to you. Okay. Now there are different types of evidence that we can look for, and I'm not talking about you know hiring a PI. I'm not talking about um, you tracking them on your cell phone, GPSing them, pretty much stalking them where they're going. I'm not talking about that kind of evidence, okay? Because that's not really where God goes. And we're going to go where God goes today, okay? So the evidence of infidelity, the three I'm going to start with are what I call the three Ds, okay? Deceit, defensiveness, and deflection. So it is very, very common for an addict or a serial adulterer uh, to be a pathological liar. A lot of the times it comes from that they've pretty much grown up with these things in their life. And so they've learned to hide their sin uh, because they're ashamed. And it just keeps getting heaped one on top of the other. And so they become pathological liars. They don't do it on purpose. It's become their practice, and that is just what they do so they can keep medicating their pain, okay? So if there's a lot of deceit, if there's a lot of weirdness in your conversation, in your communication, in the way that they conduct their lives, um, it may not be sexual sin, but pretty likely that it's there because um, that's the direction that most men go, especially in our society today, is they lean toward impurity. It's every man's battle. Um, but they also, when we try to bring something up about it, they get really defensive. Um, they make excuses or they resort to deflection, which is they're trying to take the focus off themselves. They're trying to blame it on somebody else. Maybe try to blame it on you. Try to blame it on their stress. Try to blame it on their job, their kids, whatever. They're trying to deflect 
so that the attention, so that the spotlight isn't on themselves, okay? So if you get that defensiveness, if they jump down your throat when you ask them, why do you keep asking me about this or whatever, that's a pretty good indication, okay? Against evidence that something is going on, okay? Especially if it's happening repeatedly. Um, the only reason we try to hide is because we're hiding something, okay? So another thing that can happen is there's blame shifting. You know, if you gave me more sex, if you dressed more sexy, if you did this, if you did that, if you kept this house cleaner, if you kept those kids out of my hair or whatever, I wouldn't have to do this, okay? So there's blame shifting. Uh, uh, and that is not accepting responsibility for where they are in life and what's going on in their life. The next one is gaslighting. And this is kind of a phrase that not everybody is familiar with. The bottom line is making you feel like you're crazy, um, that you maybe bring things up that have happened and they're like, I didn't do that. Um, you must be mistaken. No, that didn't really happen. And you're like, no, I know that it did. And you start questioning your own memory. You start questioning your sanity. Um, that's gaslighting. There was a movie that was done in the 40s. Uh, and then remade, I know, I, I think it's in the 60s or whatever, but it's basically um, that you're made to feel like you're crazy. And that's because they're trying to take the focus off themselves and to turn it on to you. And um, I'm, I, I'm not down on addicts, <laughs> um, but I recognize that Satan has, is really playing with their minds. And so they're simply resorting to hiding their sin. And so when this gaslighting happens, I don't think most people, and again, I'm saying most because there are some people out there who are very vindictive, who um, are really driven by um, satanic forces. Um, but I think the majority of, of, of men, and I'm specifically speaking for men in some of these things, is because they, they are just trapped in their own prison. And they don't even realize that they're there. Uh, they're, they're afraid. They're afraid of being caught. They're afraid of the shame that will be exposed. And so they're doing everything they can to hide that. And so the gaslighting comes on blaming you is because they don't want to take responsibility. Okay. They can also resort to passive aggressive tactics. Okay. That's saying things without saying things. It's this subtext that goes on in the conversation. You know, if you did this or no, it would really be great if you did this or, you know, and we can do that. We can do that with stuff around the house. Um, we can basically say, and this is a very innocent way of doing it, but we do it. Uh, I really wish somebody would take the trash out or I'm, you know, I'm in the shower. It'd be nice if somebody, you know, would wash the dishes while I'm doing all these other things for everybody else. Instead of just speaking the truth and saying, can you take the trash out tonight, please? Or uh, I'm in the middle of something. Could you please help me with this? And so we don't, we want to speak the truth and love. And so instead of doing this subtext, you know, we personally have to be an example of not using the passive aggressive tactics, but that's a great evidence, great sign or proof that something is going on, especially when you are addressing topics that have to do with where they are at, what they are doing, what's on their phone, um, what they're watching on the computer, you know, all those, if they're resorting to passive aggressive tactics, they are hiding something. Okay, that is the evidence that you need. These are all evidence, clear evidence. You don't have to go, you know, tracking down where they are on their GPS, on their phone, okay? You don't have to scan through all their texts. You don't have to sneak while they're sleeping and look on their phone of all the texting that they're doing. That's just gonna drive you crazy, okay? You don't need all the evidence, all right? There's something going on, especially when it comes to purity, is there's a lack of accountability in our spouse's life. In John chapter three, verses 19 through 21, this is a great example of um, when Jesus was talking about sin. And he says, uh, this is the verdict, light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God, okay? So when we bring ourselves in the light, okay, we are inviting people into our life to help us to see how we're not like Jesus, okay? When we hide, 
when we hide, it says that that we will not come into the light for fear that our deeds will be exposed. So if your spouse does not have an accountability partner, they do not have spiritually mature men in their life helping them to deal with all the things that men have to deal with because you can't do that because you're not a spiritual man. Hopefully you're a spiritual woman, but they need to have spiritual men in their life helping them to be open and they're getting help with those things. If they don't have that, again, clear sign something is going on, okay? Now, what is the opposite of that look like? So if you're kind of going, yeah, some of these are there, I can see some of the evidence, the opposite of how we know our spouse is really being open and changing and, and dealing with sin in their character is in 2 Corinthians 7, verses 10 through 11. And this is talking about godly sorrow, okay? Now, being very upfront here, every man has an issue with this purity, okay? Especially in our society today. If any man says that he doesn't struggle with this purity, he's a liar, okay? And, I'm, and it's not just what I'm saying. This is what the Bible says, okay? So if he basically saying, I don't struggle with my purity at all, then his definition of purity is very different what God's definition of purity is, okay? And he needs to get in the scriptures, all right? But you need to have a conviction about what repentance from dealing with impure issues really looks like based on what the scriptures say. And in 2 Corinthians 7, uh, verse 10, it says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourself to be innocent in this matter. When they are really being open, when they are really striving to be pure in their hearts with God, they recognize the areas of their heart that is, they have a sinful nature. And that sinful nature is constantly battling with them. He talks about that in Romans 7, verse 15 and following, that we all long to do something that a lot of times we don't do. We want to follow God. We want to do what's right. But intent, instead, we choose to do what is wrong. Okay. So when we are accountable, we have somebody in our life helping us to deal with this stuff. Then we take on these characteristics in 2 Corinthians 7, that there's an earnestness and eagerness to not continue following that sin. We're indignant. We're indignant over it. We're indignant over the fact that we've hurt people. And we're going to go to whatever lengths it takes to be able to be right with God and to choose purity over impurity. So, so you can really see, you have the evidence there. If these things are going on in your spouse's life, if you're seeing these day in and day out, there is probably impurity in their life. Okay. Now, why didn't you recognize this as evidence before? Why have you had to obsess? You know, why have you spent years, you know, months or um, you know, just running, running, running after trying to figure out what they're doing, you know, obsessing over it, feeling like you don't even have a life anymore because your mind is so full of what is he doing? What is he doing? What is he doing? Okay. Now, if you didn't recognize um, this evidence, because it's, it's all over the scriptures. Um, this is the way that God thinks. This is the way that Jesus thinks. So if you didn't recognize this evidence, it's super, super important that you realize why. OK, you have to understand why. Now, this isn't urgent. OK, this is more important than your spouse's betrayal. Why? In other words, why you didn't see this evidence, why you didn't is more important than why your spouse did it, what they're hiding and their excuses or even more important than their mar your marriage. OK, the why you did not see this evidence. OK, now, first, if you didn't see the evidence, OK, it's either number one. You never became a biblical disciple of Jesus, and therefore you don't recognize sin when it's right there in front of you. Okay, now it's just time to be humble here. If you have, if you did not recognize it, that's the first thing you need to ask yourself. Okay, did I become a biblical disciple of Jesus, and so therefore I recognize what sin is because I know what the scriptures say, or okay, you are a disciple of Jesus who studied the Bible before you became a Christian, you consciously and deliberately chose to make the Bible your standard, not your feelings, not what other people think. You chose to make the Bible your standard and you count the cost of what it meant to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Okay. If you did those things, then you 
and you and you still did not catch the evidence here okay then you have unwittingly fallen into Satan's most common ploy and that is more than likely you have stopped living by faith and have given way to fear okay you have stopped living by faith and you have given way to fear I want you to imagine this whole process like it's on an arrow. On one side, you have faith, and on the other side, you have fear. When you become a disciple of Jesus, all right, you get baptized, your sins are forgiven, you know, you're living in step with the Holy Spirit, you're reading your Bible, you're praying every day, you know, your faith is strong, God is awesome. Okay, you're way down here on the faith side, everything's doing great, okay? But then, something starts to happen, all right? You start, you argue with your spouse. The kids get sick. There's a job loss, the family issues, there's work, finances, you know, your spouse starts showing evidence of infidelity, but you're too distracted to recognize the symptoms. You're not in the word. You're not hearing Jesus's voice like he talks about in John 10, okay? So now you're somewhere between faith and fear, okay? But you know what you need to do but fear is starting to drive you because you're not listening to Jesus' voice. You're not staying in the word. And gradually, as things get worse and worse and worse, you just kind of sleep, you keep slipping down. So where fear is now the thing that is ruling your mind and your heart. And you have a hard time even believing or seeing faith in this position, okay? So what has happened? What happens in that process when we go from fear, okay, from faith, to fear how do we slide down that slide okay most important thing we have to see is that we've taken our eyes off Jesus okay um, when Peter when Jesus was out walking on the water in Matthew 14 okay Peter was brave and I would probably not have been brave enough to do this myself but Peter basically said Jesus if that's really you let me come walk on the water with you you know, and all the other disciples are like, are you crazy? But Peter gets out of the boat and he starts walking toward Jesus. Yay, Peter, great job, great faith that he got up and walked out on the water toward Jesus. But then it says, but when Peter saw the wind and the waves, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. It says immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? All right. And see, really, when we take our eyes off of Jesus, what happens? Okay. What happens? We give into fear. We become what I call practical atheists. All right. We unconsciously, not, not super consciously, but we unconsciously tell God that he isn't powerful enough to work in our life. All right. Because all these things we're so focused on, these things that drive us to fear, those are greater than God because we're not in God's word. We're not focusing on spiritual things. So we basically unconsciously tell God he isn't enough, that he, maybe he doesn't care enough to take care of our needs. You know, if God really loved me, why would he allow these things to happen in my life? And so what we do is we say, if God won't do this, then I'm going to have to step in. Okay, we become practical atheists. Um, consequently, what we try to do is we try to take control of what's going on in our life, okay? We move into what's called a state of denial, you know, believing we have the power to take control of our life and to really take control of our spouse. And, and we have the, 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 the power to make our marriage work. We have the power to, to transform our husbands. If we just do this, if he just does this, and if I can just line this thing up, you know, and if, or if I can be, you know, more sexy, or if I could, you know, cook better, or if I could make the house cleaner, or if I could be whatever, fill in the blank, okay? We try to take control from God because we're afraid because God is not doing what we think he should be doing, all right? But when all of our efforts don't work and things just keep getting worse and worse and worse, we become afraid even more so, and we isolate, okay? We try harder. We put our head down and we just keep running, 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 running as fast as we can, trying to make things work until we're exhausted, okay? Um, there's a Bugs Bunny cartoon. I can't remember what it was, but it came out years and years ago when I was young. And Yosemite Sam was chasing Bugs Bunny around, okay? 
and Bugs finally stops, okay, sticks his hand out and just hits, you know, gets it right here on Sam's forehead. But Sam doesn't even realize he's been stopped. And so he's still running, as fast as he can, running, 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 in place as fast as he can. And then he stops for a second, he's like, <sighs> and then he keeps running, keeps running, keeps carrying. And Bugs is sitting there with his hand resting on his forehead, eating his carrot, okay? And Sam finally just stops realizing what he's done and he's exhausted himself, okay? I think that's sometimes what we could do in our pursuit to try to fix our marriage. We have taken our eyes off of God and we're running as fast as we can thinking we know what we're doing and we're exhausting ourselves. Have you gotten that point yet where you've exhausted yourself? Well, I want to encourage you to realize that there's a pretty good chance that you have changed your standard. Okay, You've gone from God's standard of the word to man's standard. Okay, You're, you're looking to try to do things your way rather than God's way, okay? So I've heard of ladies, God help you, that have hired private investigators, okay, to stalk their spouses to find out if they're being unfaithful. We have the best private eye in the universe, and he's called God, okay? He knows exactly what's going on in, in our spouse's life, okay? Um, we don't have to check their messages. We don't have to, if those things are brought, God brings those to our attention, okay? fine, but we don't have to go searching for them, okay? If we are driven to fear, then that is how we are acting. We're trying to catch our, our, our spouses in the act, but God knows exactly what's going on. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 17, he says that nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account, okay? And then in Psalm 98, he says, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Okay. So like, we don't have to see all this stuff. God sees it. God's very aware of what's going on in our life, the things that we're hiding and what's going on in our spouse's life. And God cannot be mocked. Okay. Sometimes we, we wonder like God really sees us, but why isn't God doing anything about it? He's working. Okay, we cannot mock God. Okay, Isaiah 55, I think it's verses 8 and 9 says that, that God's ways are not our ways. Okay, he's, he's working all the time, but it may just not be in our time frame. So we need to realize that, that God really is in control, but we're trying to do things our because we don't like God's timetable. You know, we don't, I, my husband and I, we were separated. You know, after three months, I was like, okay, God, what's up? You know, why is it taking him so long to repent? I had no idea it was going to take four years for us to get back together. But I didn't like that time frame. And I think I would have, if at three months I would have known it would have taken that long, I would have said, forget it. I'm giving up. But God had a different plan. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we trying to expect God to go on our time frame? You know, are we going to be on God's time frame? So the Old Testament, um, in if you go back and look through the Old Testament, a lot of times when there was a crime brought forth, somebody was accused of something, they had to come forth with the testimony of two or three witnesses. Okay, that was the only way the person could be proved wrong. And 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 our laws in our country now, especially if you're living in the states, the laws really we you have to have evidence to prove something. That's how somebody's proved guilty. And so that's so much in our mindset as our culture, I have to prove they're wrong to bring this evidence in front of them, you know. But like we said and we read we were talking earlier in John 3 19 through 21, God wants us to let the sin be brought into the light, that God will bring it into the light. You know, our spouse will be bringing things into the light eventually when they repent, okay? Um, if they have something to hide, it's going to come out, okay? So, and it really doesn't matter what the sin is, God will eventually expose it, all right? So we don't have to give way to fear. Now, what we do have to do is a couple of things. Number one, we have to set our minds on things above, Okay, when we're working through man's standards, when we're working through our own way of thinking, then then we're focused on the world. We're focused on the things that are right in front of us. But God says this, you know, this life is very temporary. We have to look beyond that. And so in Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2, he says, since then you have been raised with Christ. And if we're followers of Jesus, if we're disciples of Jesus, we have been raised with Christ. He says, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. 
right? So and I'm not talking about putting your head in the sand and forgetting all this is going on, okay? We're going to talk about what recovery looks like in just a second. But I'm talking about what we focus on, okay? Where our faith is. He says in Hebrews uh, 11, verse uh, 6, he says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so we have to keep our eyes focused on God and what he is doing, what the scriptures call us to, okay? And really when we're doing that, we're going to see people the way God sees people. In uh, 1 Samuel 16, 7, when the prophet Samuel went to go look for a king, he was looking for David. He didn't know it was David, but he went looking for a king. Um, so, uh, David's father brought out all the other sons, and there was like six other sons. I want to say six, maybe more. Um, there were other sons, and he brought them all out and marched them before Samuel. And Samuel was like, oh, yeah, him, because yeah, they were all you know, tall and handsome. And, and God's like, no. And he says in verse 7, he said, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And see, when we are thinking like God, when we are immersed in God's word, when we're setting our minds and our hearts on things above, we start looking at people's hearts more than their outward appearance, okay? Maybe what they're saying. We are looking at their actions, okay? What's coming out. So that's God's standard. And the more we're focused on God's word, the more we're going to look at people from a heart perspective rather than an external perspective, okay? Uh, and then in Luke 6.45, we have even better, uh, better opportunity. We can see how Jesus even said that we can discern other people's hearts. So he says in 6.45, he says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of, okay? So we can know what comes out of our mouth is what is in our heart. There's no way around that. I mean, this is a truth, okay? So if 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 there are uh, things coming out of our spouse's mouth where there is deceit, there is lying, there is covering things up, then they're covering up something that's going in their heart. But this also goes back to us. We have to be accountable for what we are thinking, what we are feeling, where our heart is. So we have to face that mirror of who we really are, really ask ourselves, even in, in, in our own relationship with our spouse, when we are asking them these things and then we start a fight, are we fighting back and forth? Where is our heart on that? What's coming out of our mouth, okay? So I think it's really coming down to if, um, if your spouse is not completely transparent, okay, with their phone, with their computer, with their schedule, with their location, where they are all the time, if they are not transparent, if they are trying to be, well, I was doing this or making excuses or whatever, okay, that's all the evidence you need that something is going on, okay? Now, especially if this is repetitive, it keeps happening, then more than likely there is some impurity going on. I'm not going to say it's a fact. God will reveal the facts in his good time. But the evidence is there that something is going on. You do not have to track it down. God already sees it. And the question you have to ask yourself is, do you trust him? Do you trust him more than you trust yourself? Okay. Is he your God? Okay. All right. So if you have the evidence, okay, if these things are going on, if you have the evidence, okay, now what do you do? What do you do at this point? Okay, the first thing is you have to get out of denial and accept your powerlessness to change your spouse. We have a hard enough time changing ourselves. okay? If we are, you know, trying to lose some pounds or, you know, keep our mouth shut when we want to scream at somebody, okay, it is hard enough for us to change ourselves. We cannot take on changing a spouse, all right, or um, anybody in our life, all right? So, we got to get out of that denial that we can't do that and recognize our powerlessness. Number two, we have to um, recognize our own sin. And we've been talking all about this taking control. The Bible calls that idolatry, all right? We have to recognize that we have been idolatrous, that we have tried to take control of what is going on, take the reins out of God's hand and do things our way. And basically what that says is we have forsaken our first love. Okay, in, in uh, Revelations 2, 4, 
Jesus challenged the church in Ephesus that they had, they were doing a lot of great things, but they had lost their first love and he was their first love. And if we're trying to wrestle control from God, wrestle control from Jesus, then, then we've forgotten that he's our first love and he has control with, that's going on in our life. And we initially gave him control and we need to give it back. Number three, we need to repent. All right. And repentance, it's gotten a bad connotation in the last hundred years. Okay. Repentance simply means to change your mind, to, to change the, the direction that your mind has been going in and turn it in the other direction and go toward God. So we basically have to match our mind with God's mind. It talks about that in Romans 12 too, okay, to transform our minds so that we can know what God's will is for our life. All right. Number four, we need to set our minds and our hearts on things above. And of course that comes from Colossians 3, 1 and 2, we just read that. And number five, we need to learn how to set healthy boundaries in our life so that we can start the recovery process. Because really, like I said, we can't control what our spouse does, what they choose to do, but we can set healthy boundaries so that we have a safe sanctuary, a safe place where we can start to heal. All right. Now, if you want to get practical help to do that, then I want you to go ahead and schedule a free breakthrough call with me at hopeforspouses.com slash call. Again, that's hopeforspouses.com slash call. We'll get on the phone for about 45 minutes and we'll talk a little bit about what's going on in your life. And my goal is to give you some clarity, direction, and really bring the scriptures into play here so you can really know what direction you need to go in to really start the recovery process. Okay, so that is it for today. Again, my name is Kim Pullen, Hope for Spouses. We will see you next week. Take care.